my name is Ron Hood and welcome to volume 16 of the Woods Masters series where we teach you to be the Woods Master. In this volume of the Woods Master we're going to be taking a close look at buffalo. We want to see how the animals are harvested, how they're processed, and uh, we want to see how all the components of the animal are turned into usable goods. The best way to introduce this video is to actually have a chat with one of the principals in it and that would be Joe Bigley. So let's meet Joe and find out a little bit about him. I've known Joe for several years and Joe is not only a good friend of mine but uh, the author of two outstanding books about survival. One of these books is about survival schools and their instructors and the other one is an outstanding book about wilderness skills and all kinds of other survival related issues. These are, are must-haves for your survival library. And I can go on talking about those but I think it's best if I just introduce Joe. Joe? Thanks, Ron. Uh, as you may or may not know, uh, Denise and I founded Salmon Outdoor School around 1997, about a year after I retired from the military. We teach primitive outdoor skills there, and two of our, our, our most popular courses are the basic course, where we teach the, the big three of survival, fire, shelter, and water, with a few primitive skills thrown in. And then the, the most popular, I think, is the Stone Age skills course, where we teach people the skills that their ancestors used. And from a pandemic viewpoint, where they're not any one particular cultural group, but things that could be used anywhere by anybody and could have been used anywhere by anybody, getting people to think along the lines of, of uh, noticing the resources that surround them and uh, determine what they can do with them. And that's what we like to do. We've uh, done this, a very similar project like that here at the Sacagawea Center and where we built the primitive village using materials from uh, what was on scene uh, to build the, the uh, Sacagawea uh, School of Discovery primitive village. Thank you, Joe. I think that pretty much sums up part of what's going to happen here. And I just want to add that Joe and Denise have done an outstanding job of arranging all the things that you're going to see in this video. So settle back, we're off for an adventure. Okay, uh, good morning. My name is Dallas Dupree. Uh, I own a meat shop here in Salmon, Idaho, Lakota Meats. Um, we are going to demonstrate to do uh, authentic buffalo kill. Uh, I am Lakota Sioux, so we're going to do it authentically Indian, Native American. Uh, style, so I guess we'll go ahead and get ready to, to take care of the, the killing.
I'm going to say a quick prayer to give thanks uh, for bringing this buffalo to us. Uh, I'd like to thank the Creator for um, creating this buffalo that we are going to um, harvest today. Uh, let the meat nourish our bodies um, and use everything off the buffalo as we could, as um, we have learned in the past um, by our ancestors. Uh, and again, bless, bless everybody and bless the buffalo and uh, let us have a, a, a good experience. What we're going to do is spread out the front legs mm -hmm. and work the front first, and then we'll just take the back legs and spread them out. Okay. There you go. Want to spread the legs? Here we go. 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 Back legs, legs out. out. Yep. Legs out. Can I go? It's okay. Just lay it up. Sure. Sure. She will. There we go. Yeah. There we go. There. Might want to crank her head maybe this uh, way a little bit. Oh, yeah. There you go. Can I All right. With um, elk, I usually Mark, put yeah, a trying. steak in on the side of the neck. We, we can do that. We have a steak. Huh? Do we have one? If you have one, yeah. It's in the truck. No, he likes hay. Oh, yeah. I just keep them. Every, every one I've ever done, you get up the middle, and then you roll them over like this and let everything fall out, uh -huh. you know? <clears throat> well, if you want to, I'll tell you how I did it, and then if you want to do it that way, you can do it, okay? Uh, I start just above the tail, strip forward, put the knife up underneath the fur, because the fur will catch your blade, kick it just right up about here, and then you have to stand on it to pull it off, and that's the way. But yeah, I'll cook pretty tight to hide that. What we're thinking? Is, is just peel it down like this, right? And then just take it off. Yeah. Okay. Cool. But if you start at the back, you start with a more stable platform. Makes good sense to me. I'm just gonna sit this thing over here. Nice to meet you. What are they cutting? This is an ulu style knife, um, made uh, from glass butte obsidian. It's hafted into a piece of deer antler with a type of cutler's pitch and it was used in a slicing motion like this a lot of times it's called a woman's knife because women used it to cut food with but we're going to try to use it a little bit here today <coughs> this is just a plain old stone flake it's from also from glass butte and we're going to try out in central oregon and we're going to try to use this a little bit today to see just how well a stone tool would work on cutting up and butchering a, a large animal. These here are just stone knives. My son Mark made this. This is a piece of obsidian also hafted onto what looks like a piece of cherry wood with real sinew and pitch. And Mark is was nine years old when he made this. <clears throat> these are just more stone knives. I don't know if we're going to try to use these today or not, but these are uh, typical of the types of uh, things that could be used. I think really um, in ancient times this was probably the tool that was used the most rather than sitting around trying to put a haft on a blade because there's no strength in this and if you try to crank on it at all it'll break and all that time and effort that you put into it is wasted whereas all you have to do is hit this thing off of a, a boulder and you've got an instant ready edge if you if you were to run your finger across that with any kind of pressure you'd find yourself cut right to the bone. This is very sharp. This is what's called a Danish dagger. It's also made of glass butte obsidian, pumpkin and orange and it was made by my friend Ron Macy. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, it's, it's Denise's knife. 
of course, because uh, what's mine is hers and we're in a community property state, so this is her knife. <laughs> <laughs> this is one that I forged. It's, it's made out of a piece of uh, 5160 truck leaf spring. <clears throat> it's hafted into a deer antler and I, I like the way that the shape was with this, so we're going to try this out a little bit today too. I would like to have had a longer piece of steel to make a longer blade, but this is what I got. This is what we're going to use. This is also forged from a file. I didn't make this, but I liked it so much that I had to have it. It's got a perfect profile here. It's very thin, so we ought to be able to get some real good cooking, or cooking, harf, harf, harf. We ought to be able to get some real good cutting in with this, okay, because it's, it's really thin as opposed to something with a really honking, thick back spine like this, which I don't find cuts very well. This is one that I did make for my wife. Uh, <clears throat> And we'll see how this works today, too. She hasn't kept a very good edge on this, so I'm going to have to get her to uh, maybe do a little bit of work before we get to cutting. All these are, these are John Noel and Son butcher knives. They're similar to the kind that were used all throughout the late 1700s and all through the, the 1800s. These were the kind of knives that people carried. They had... Um, if they didn't have a forged knife like this that was made by a country blacksmith, they had something that came from England, usually from Sheffield. And this kind is, is, is commonly called a scalper knife. I don't know why. All it is is it looks like a French cook's knife. But they, this was supposedly the, the type of blade shape that was used to cut your scalp off. Of course, they'd be really lacking if they went after my scalp. They'd be wasting their time. But this is the butcher style. This is also a John Noel and Son uh, original Sheffield knife. And we're going to be using all of these today, <coughs> along with some of these other obsidian flakes and blades. So without further ado, we'll probably go ahead and, and get started. We're going to be using other tools as well, probably this little Gerber hatchet that Ron brought, and see how this works. Hey, you could just about shave with that thing. And then just stick the knife in sideways, <coughs> turn it, and then strip and run it up like that. And you feel the vertebrae as you go. Mm -hmm. Guide the blade with your finger. Okay. So, so we make a cut like that. Ooh, how thick is her? Thick. We're there. We're there. I turn the blade sideways. Yeah. Just set it up. Yeah, there you go. There we go. Watch me cut my damn hand off here. That's okay, I brought the first aid kit. Okay, good, we're good to go then. Then, then just do this. Just like that? Yeah, then you could feel the vertebrae. Then, then you, you, you got control of the blade. Uh-huh, that's what you think. Yeah. Actually, man with blade, that's dangerous, not dangerous man with blade. <laughs> so, yeah. There we go. Let's get up under it. There we go. Yeah, that's the wrong blade shape for that because, but we can go ahead and give it a try, try whatever you like. Try a different blade shape. Okay. This one. Oh, I can't oh, yeah. This would be good for cutting slide. meat. Probably not as sharp as Joe's at all. There you go. What did you do with the obsidian? It's very sharp. And you're using obsidian. Well, yeah, I think that's what this is. It's from Glass Butte, um, and it has a it has a scientific name for it. That I don't know what that it is. Yes, right. Yeah, I'll remember it after you guys have gone back to Coeur d'Alene. Well, it's an igneous uh, rock. 
Okay. Oh, that sounds professional. That igneous. Yeah, that means fire <coughs> Oh, I thought it meant it didn't know nothing, didn't it? Isn't that what igne igneous yeah. amos is? Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Don't left turn. Well, I, I think it's, it's a piece of uh, lever right. It's right where you found it. Lever right there, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, Mark, I'm going to let you cut this. And remember, you've already had one obsidian cut already, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, don't well, use we another. Mark doing right up in here. Right up in here. By the edges okay. so we don't cut the main part of the skin. Well, just go ahead. It. He's got it. Get up in here. There you go. Careful, careful, careful. You want to go slow and be careful, buddy, because yeah. you don't want to cut the hide. You, you don't want to cut it. dead. Homie, well, don't, don't worry play about dad, but you can only get one of these. Hey, dude, homie, right. don't play dad. Just don't worry about dad. He's skin to be. Just this. What is it? That's skin to be. This is just a piece of some kind of, looks like a sedimentary stone. See? And this is what uh, we call a disc knife in the vernacular. And all you do is you just get a boulder, it's about the size of a football, and you smack it on something until a disc shaped blade pops off and you can see here that you have a fairly thin sharp edge as opposed to a thicker edge here so you would hold it in your hand perhaps like this and and use it to to cut with and I think we could do that with this and I want to give this a try here's some nice sinew that we see here so let's give it a try not as sharp as the obsidian but as you can see it's working okay Hmm. It's pretty cool. Now let's, let's get a piece of that obsidian here, Zach, and see how much different we get with this. Oh yeah. <laughs> see the difference? You can really tell the difference with this. It just cuts really, really nice. Very sharp. This is an example of what I was talking about earlier when I said I think that this is probably the most commonly used stone knife as opposed to something that was hafted. Zach here was using this nice piece of obsidian uh, that was hafted onto an antler and he just put a little bit too much pressure on it, which is easy to do when you're doing this kind of work, and zingo, it comes off and pretty soon he's going to be just holding the blade and using it anyway. So <clears throat> for expedience, just take a piece of, <clears throat> piece of stone like this. Make sure it has a sharp edge and use it. And uh, and like Ron said, this is a pair of leverite, or this is <laughs> a leverite stone. Uh, when you're done, you just lever right there. You don't have to worry about any any work that you put into it because it's already done. It's already served its purpose. All right, and then right down here. Ah, uh, getting nice and chilly now. Look how nice and, and thick and wide that sinew strap is. That's so funny. We have some here that's already dried in a couple of years now. Yeah, maybe. Not right where to go. You get all cattle locally. Yes. You do sheep too. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, that looks wonderful. Made it himself. What do you think, Dallas? 
Do I lung in here? Or am I going to be, huh? Let's finish taking off the, the rest of the hump roast okay, and okay. the milk meat. Okay. And then we'll work that back out and I'll show you how to do it with that pin going like that. Okay, good. Got a lot of good meat right there. Mm -hmm. The rat ones? Huh? The rat ones. Let's put it in there right here. Okay, this is going to be a project right here. We're cutting the back end of this buffalo off uh, because we want to get the guts out. We don't want this animal to bloat up and spoil on us. And um, so that's what we're trying to do here. Now we're, and as you can see, it's starting to, to bloat a little bit. Nothing to worry about yet, but this is this is a little bit different from uh, the traditional way of of uh, skinning and gutting an animal, where you take it up the up the middle from the belly. Uh, on a larger animal like a buffalo, uh, it's harder to do, especially on a on a big bull. Of course, this is a small cow, but we wanted to do this the traditional way, or the ancient way rather, because. Um, as, as I said, this is an experimental archaeology project that we are we're trying here at the Sacagawea Center. Get my leg up. Ooh, man, if we only had smell vision right now. Mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> man, that reeks. Good for fear factor. Yeah. <laughs> Dive into this kid. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The stomach Take a taste. contents of a buffalo. Mm. Oh my goodness. Send one of the small kids in there. <laughs> Let me know if you're getting tarred. I've been a tarred all my life. Yeah, I was going to say something like that. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> but, hey, guys. That's interesting, Dad. Grab on. Grab on, Zach. Pull. I'm allergic yeah. to me. There we go. Don't be a that's teenager. Hey, Mike. <laughs> Come on over here, buddy. I'm allergic to that. Uh, that's it. It's warm. It's squishy. <laughs> no green juices. Zachary. Sure is taste. What you got there? Ah. Uh huh. Hey, you. What are you tying, tying now? What? The bottom of the soft kiss of the stomach. Okay. Pick that up. And put it because we're gonna get rid of the lungs here, and then she can have her, her stomach for her soup bowl. I'm trying to be like Joe. Yeah. Yeah. You. Yeah. Hey. Um, you ready? Your son's been cooking this all day. It's a fine piece of meat. I want as much as I can get. Mmm. Hoorah. So, where's the bladder? Uh! That's why God gave us sharp teeth in the front. Cover them. It's actually quite tasty. Mm -hmm. Very good. Is it raw? It's still no, a little bit raw, raw. But not bad. But it's good. Mm -hmm. Take a bite on the outside. Okay. Okay. We're getting the gut separated from the stomach here. Then we're going to empty the stomach contents. Or actually, I'm going to let Denise do that, I think. <laughs> 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 so, we're going to try to... That's a heavy belly. <laughs> squeeze the contents out of the guts. And maybe save them and use them for Baudin Blanc. Is that how you say that? Baudin Blanc. You talking about the Vietnamese cooking thing? Well, it was... Charbonneau, who made a white guts. white, yeah, yeah. Blanc, blanc. But I'm not sure if, if, I don't speak French, so I don't know how to pronounce that exactly. I don't either. Oh, well. I, it's I, wee wee poop sack. There we go, yeah. There we go. 
Next step. <laughs> Look at that. See the thing there? See the thing here? You hold that in right there. Oh. Come on, come on. Do that. Okay, now put your hand out there. No, you're dead. No. Put him back. Come on. See that? Put your hand right here now and feel that. I did. It's a turd. It's good, dude. Oh. It's a dog. He's over there. Oh, 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 when we butcher buffalo or beef cows, we pretty much consume everything, mm -hmm. which means we eat everything. So this piece right here is called what we call the Bible. It's got really thin pages in it. So basically it's just one of the stomachs that a buffalo has to digest the hay. And there you can see the hay in there. Um, <clears throat> most of the time we clean this all out. Uh, when I was younger, we used uh, we used to use the creek or the river, and we'd all stand in the creek, the whole family, and we'd clean out the parts of, of the cow stomach or whatever, um, and and try and clean most of the manure out. My grandmother used to always tell us when we we're when we we're cleaning this kind of stuff is to leave a little flavor in it because she didn't want it too clean, so we try and leave some of the green stuff in it. This is the regular stomach right here. Basically, I just cut off that portion here. And now I'm just gonna go ahead and cut and make a larger cut into the stomach. Okay, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna clean out the manure. Uh, that's kind of a messy job. Some people don't like to do it, but... Do you want me to do that too? What's that? Do you want me to do it? No, this is fine. Basically, we're just cleaning out the contents of the stomach of the buffalo. All it is is just manure, a feed. It's got a quite pungent order like cow manure. <laughs> but when I get it all cleaned out, I'll show you some stuff. That's a lot of and I'll finish it up here. We're gonna take this to the creek now and finish it up, get all the grass off it, wash out the manure on the inside, and we'll take this part too and we'll do the same thing with that. So right. follow me. I think it's over there, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, what she's gonna do now is she's gonna go ahead and put the stomach in the water and she's gonna start rinsing it out. See all the manure starting to come out of it? And she just keeps on rinsing it until the green starts going away and then it starts getting clean. And right now it's already starting to get really clean now. And we just rinse and rinse and rinse. So am I supposed to leave a little bit of... Whatever you want to do. <laughs> leave a little bit in there for the flavor? Yeah. Is the water cold? So I remember when I was growing up, my grandmother used to cut this up and put spaghetti sauce on it. Oh, really? Yeah. It was a delicacy. Although not for the kids. Right. Yep. But the adults, they loved it. My grandfather did the same thing. It's an Italian thing, right? That's right. It's an Italian thing. Yeah. <coughs> Mexicans heat it up with spicy stuff and call it menudo. That's right. Right. That's right. Oh, my grandmother always told us to cook it outside because she didn't want the smell in the house. <laughs> now with it cleaned off here, you kind of can see the different chambers of the stomach. There's one chamber there. Here's the main chamber. And then here's the third stomach. And that piece that she's washing off there is the fourth stomach. Just like a cow would have four stomachs for digestion. How come it's all red? Because of the blood? Mm -hmm. 
Amazing. That feels cool. There's a little bit of different different pattern there. Amazing. You can feel it. Something created that has Oh wow, it's really soft and lacy. Wow. That's amazing. A lot of variety. Mm-hmm. Wow. Oh that that's the one you call the Bible. That's that's the one that actually has like little pages in it. Uh-huh. I see now. <clears throat> Is it thin? Oh, they are thin. Yeah. Look at that. And you can see the manure going away. That's why tricks are so nice to use because yeah. the manure just floats away and it goes away. You need to apply your legs at home. No, actually, it's nice. Look at that, Ron. And there must be how many folds in this, Dallas? <laughs> where it looks really... Yeah, where it's easy to see. Right here. Look at that. Woo! Okay, yeah. So you just have to clean out each individual chamber. Wow, look at that. You see how many of them? There's quite a few of them. Yeah. <laughs> so That's... I, I think I've gotten about halfway through. Oh my gosh. And I have a little bit more to go see this one. Oh yeah. Needs okay. Needs a little work. Great. We're just going to fold this up right now, skin to skin, and uh, just take it over to the meat locker to to preserve it, keep it chilled until we have a chance to flesh it. And then we're gonna, later on we're gonna brain tan this thing. And uh, I was thinking originally that what we might do is, is do it the old way and split it down the gut, tan the two halves, and then sew them back together down the backbone. But it's really, really small. I mean, it may not have to do that at all. Yeah. So we might be able to just tan it all in one piece backwards. Yeah. And uh, I still haven't decided, but that's down the road. What temperature are you going to keep this out to save it, and how long are you going to keep it for? Until Frozen. You mm -hmm. freeze it. Yeah. Okay. Frozen, and then how long is it going to be until you use it? Um, if we don't get it before August, we'll be tanning this thing during the 1805 living experience August 12th to 21st 2005 for the Lewis and Clark Bicentennial at the Sacagawea, at the Center. Sacagawea Center in Salmon, Idaho, in Salmon, Idaho. <laughs> starring yours truly <laughs> all right <coughs> okay that looks like my ball sign <laughs> I was just gonna say Joe you have a mighty hairy ball sign you were gonna say that to me <laughs> Yeah. Well, the way you were holding it earlier, oh, <laughs> you were holding it like right there, like you couldn't go on any further. Did, did you get a picture of that? Yeah. Okay. Ladies <laughs> and gentlemen. That I might, gentleman. I might yeah. adjust his voice yeah. a little bit for that one. Yeah. yeah. Whoa. 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 <laughs> okay. <laughs> this way. <laughs> We're good to go. Okay, what is this? Is this I'm attempting to knock a blade off of this piece of obsidian. There's a place you can see here where we got a, a nice blade off before. And what we're going to be trying to do is follow this ridge line down here. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to do that or not because it kind of tapers off and dies right here. But <clears throat> we'll see what we can do. And uh, once I get the blade off of here, assuming that we do, I'm going to give it to the buffalo butchers over there. And they're going to be continuing to take uh, some pieces of meat off the buffalo. 
Uh, I don't have really the, the proper tool for this. This is a kind of a hard stone for for obsidian, and uh, but it's right now it's all I have. So we'll try to see if in fact this will work, and if it doesn't, then uh, we'll try something else. You just have to hit it at the right angle and, and hit it fairly lightly, because with obsidian you don't want to use hard hammer percussion, with, uh, such as what you see with this rock. You want uh, more of a soft hammer, which would be a uh, moose or an elk antler. Sometimes a piece of copper works really well. Um, and there is uh, there is archaeological evidence that that um, people actually did use copper lumps, and it's it's just soft enough so that it grabs onto the edge of this and takes off a perfect flake. We're going to go ahead and try it anyway and see what happens. And uh, <clears throat> here we go. If um, if it doesn't work really well, Ron's going to erase this whole friggin' section. And here we go. We have a, a, a nice flake with a nice edge on it right here. And we can just go ahead and use this as is. And you can see how it just took that piece right off of there. Okay, so Ron, you don't have to erase this now. Everything is just fine. This stone is not <clears throat> the best tool for, for uh, percussion flaking obsidian. It's, it's what's considered to be a hard hammer. And uh, these ripples that you see in here are indicative of hard hammer percussion. They don't hurt anything as far as the utility of the tool goes, but when you're a, a real abo perfectionist, you don't want to see that. You want to see just a perfect smooth surface. And uh, right here you'll see the bulb of percussion. I don't know if you can see that very well. Do I need to turn this to a different angle? Okay. This is actually where I hit. And anytime you, you hit a stone that has conchoidal fracture, at, at an angle like this, you'll get what's called the bubble percussion. You can always tell where the thing was hit just by looking for this little protrusion on the end. You can also see here where the actual strike was because, like I said, this hard hammer was a little bit too much. And all I did, I just barely gave us a tap like this. But um, because I held the stone right and I had the right amount of pressure on, on the stone pressing on my leg, and because... Uh, I didn't hit it too hard, it didn't shatter, but it just peeled right off. And if we were if we were to do this and to continue to do this, this is what's called the core, and this is a this is an ancient European method of taking flakes off of a stone core. And what they would do is they would go all the way around this and until they had just about peeled this thing down into a series of flakes that were just like this one here. And I've seen um, in museums places where they've taken these flakes and actually put them back together, and you can see where they, they once formed the, the obsidian or the flint nodule. Um, this is an, an exceptionally good way of, of napping stone because you have a whole lot to work with right here. You could take this piece, and if you look at it from the side, it's not too curved. You could turn this into something... Uh, you could turn this into a projectile point very easily just by napping off the top portion of it into a point and you have razor sharp edges already. You could go ahead and just take this portion of it down so that it mounts into a haft and you have um, ready to go tools. That's uh, one of the things that's um, kind of a hallmark of prehistoric European Stone Age culture is that they were very utilitarian, not always artistic in, in what they did. And some of the stuff that you'd see um, out of Europe especially was uh, so ugly. You wouldn't want to show it to your mom as your, as your first stone tool, but that's what they used every day. And this right here is, is going to be a, a knife that we're going to use, or a knife blade that we're going to use to help butcher the buffalo carcass that's left over there. Uh, probably the best way to do this would be to dull this edge a little bit and it's called backing the blade and all we do is we just scrape it a little bit like this to take the sharp edge off and you can see right along here where those tiny microscopic flakes have, have come off. We'll just keep doing that again or you could just go ahead and abrade it just like this and that way you're, you're going to be less likely. You can see the small flakes here. Can you? I don't know if you can zoom in on that Ron or not whether that comes out. Hopefully it does. But that way you're less likely when you hold it in your hand to cut yourself. And these things will cut 
and they'll cut you deep and they'll cut you fast and you won't know that you're cut until you bled out. My son has a nasty scar right on the back of his hand that uh, he got while picking up a piece of obsidian and the thing slipped out of his hand and fell this far, hit him and cut him right to the bone. He, he required 15 stitches to, to close the wound up. Um, what else do you need to see? <laughs> Okay, now that we've made this piece, I'm going to set this hammer stone down right here because I want to maybe use it later since it works so well. And we'll take it over to the buffalo carcass and, and give it to one of the workers over there and see how it really handles. Hoorah! Stone blade. Hey. Yeah. Here, catch. No, we're not going to catch. No, we're not going to catch. I'm, I'm you don't kidding. want cookies? This is the, this is the back. This is the edge, okay? Put your hand there and use this. Okay, oh? Okay. okay, but get up off your butox. Well, oh, they're gonna good. go get me a horn. Is that pretty good, Jess? It's just slipping out of my hand. <laughs> yeah, that's really hard. No. No, Jesse. What are you doing, Jess? Okay, I'm just gonna make a cutting board out of this oh, piece of bark here so that we can Jesse, use it. What do you think, Julie? What do you mean? Is it good? Yeah. Good. It cuts good, doesn't it? Yes. Yes. It's beautiful. Just, my dad sure knows how to make a stone blade. Say that. <laughs> my dad sure knows how to make a stone blade. Right. A sharp stone blade. A sharp stone blade. Good Cut the go. heck out of you. Cut the heck out of you. Yeah, there you go. Hoorah. <laughs> Hoorah. Okay, we're going to cut the tongue here. Basically, it's got a jawbone, and how I do it is I just kind of cut the middle here, open it up, and I go all the way to the chin, down. Just ask the meat. Oh, you're cutting it open. Okay. And then what I do is I skin the cheeks back a little bit because I gotta get to the tongue which is underneath right here. And I just kinda skin the cheeks back to open it up. And then with a the clean finger I grab right here and I take my knife and I cut it right against the jaw bone. Because I can feel my knife against the bone of the jaw here on both sides. Okay, then I kind of reach in and cut it to the point of the jaw, of the bottom jaw, and I pull up, because you don't want to cut the tongue, you want to cut the little membranes that hold the tongue in place, and you pull on it. Get your hand out and then the tongue comes right out and you kind of cut back until I find these little bumps right here. And once you find those little bumps, you just cut it straight off and you got buffalo tongue. One buffalo tongue. Very good. Looks like it has fecal matter on the tongue. What's yeah. that buffalo been doing? <laughs> um, unchewed hay. When Dallas shot the buffalo <clears throat> earlier, this is where he hit, right in the center of its head, and the willow branch is sticking out of the bullet hole. Now what we're going to do is we're going to skin this head and, uh, and, and crack the skull to extract the brain. We want to try to use as much of the animal as we can. <coughs> Excuse me. And one of the things that, that was uh, used in, in ancient times and still used by me today is the animal's brain. We use it for tanning hides. The skin, the pants that I'm wearing are brain tan buckskin pants and we uh, we, we use the, um, the brain to soften them in a, in a process that we'll probably go over a little bit later on. Baby. But right now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the willow out of this animal's skull and then I'm going to turn it over. I believe Dallas was starting to skin this yesterday. The reason you skin this is because uh, we're going to try to crack the head open 
and you can't do that with the, with the skin intact on it. Um, if I was just purely going to be getting the brain out, all I would do is be make an incision in the front of the skull and peel it back and smack it with a stone or something hard to shatter the skull and then I would scoop the brains out <clears throat> and not worry about skin in the head but I think that this can make kind of a nice um, something maybe a mask who knows uh, but we're gonna try to skin the head here a little bit and and just peel it back and uh, once it's off then we'll go ahead and and crack the skull and get the brain out. And this is pretty much the same as skinning anything. You just go ahead and I'm going to cut this big piece of meat off of here. Uh, and we're not going to use this because it's been sitting out and has started to spoil. And I don't want to eat spoiled meat. Regardless of what people say about me, I don't eat spoiled meat. Um, but we'll get this off of here. We're doing really is we're trying to separate the uh, the membrane that holds it on to this to the to the head, and that's the the easiest way or the cleanest way to skin something. I'm actually going to try to separate the nose down here and see if I can peel it off that way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you want to eat the eyeball? I've eaten eyeballs like that for years. Eat one. No. The eyeballs are actually used to mix with um, different materials for to make paint pigments. Yeah. They're they're they're, they're what? They're used to mix with different materials to make paint pigments. They seem to make a good base for paint like pigments temper. and they hold um, you know, the color really well. It's very interesting. So a lot of primitive cultures um, did use the eyeball for that. Very good. We haven't eaten them. Ron oh. has, though. Ron has. He's eating eyeball stew. Ooh. And just plain old eyeballs. When Joe is finished skinning this out, and we're ready to tan this hide. We're going to tan the whole thing and sew this the facial hair here onto the top, the whole head onto the top, so it'll make a cape. It'll be a really nice addition to my Abel wardrobe. <laughs> yeah, but I might not be able to tell whether you got it on or not. <laughs> <laughs> That's terrible. Be careful, she's got a well, knife. <laughs> I got a whole plate yeah. full of <laughs> be careful. Uh, and yeah. I thought you were going to tell me you'd like to take me out maybe to a nice abo feast. Well, I would. Um, but I don't know if I'm going to be able to now. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You have a lot of making up to do. Uh, yeah, yeah. I don't mind doing it. You may have to now. Yeah, yeah you may have to, <laughs> to make up. So, Joe, why, why are the flies buzzing? I said, I'm, not, I'm not sure whether they're buzzing around the head or whether it's just me, my deodorant, or maybe or lack thereof. Like like <laughs> <their own. laughs> That. I'm not due for my month. I don't take a bath every month. <laughs> Why would I want to take one that frequently? <laughs> yeah, I mean it's it's not August yet, guys. <laughs> we have tried to use different mints and sage brushes on Joe to try to kind of. But they just wilt. <laughs> so, so it doesn't Actually, work. sagebrush works really well keeping the mosquitoes away. If you're out walking at night and you take a handful of the sagebrush leaves and you just rub them on your exposed skin, we found that the mosquitoes don't bother us that much. And we don't smell too bad either. The sagebrush is kind of a nice smell. Of course, we may not notice it either. But, you know. Well, should I rephrase that? I don't smell that bad. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what am I going to do is I'm going to take the eyeball out of the socket here and I'm going to freeze it because I'm not going to be making any paint pigments right now. But when I get ready to, I'm going to be mixing it with different types of um, plants or mineral matter to make different types of colors and pigments. And the eyeball makes a good base for those pigments and gives it a richer color. And so I like using the eyeballs for a base for paint pigments. I won't be doing that right away so I can store it either in the refrigerator for a short period of time or in the freezer for a long period of time. And so I think I'll just freeze these right now. One 
buffalo head skin. <laughs> okay, um, that's done. What I think I'm going to need to do, here's where the bullet hole went in, so the, the brain is, is right across in this area here. Um, and what, it looks like it might have shattered the back of the skull here too. As you can see, actually where's that ATAX here? Let me put this thing to use. You can see where the occipital bone is, uh, is separated from the rest of the skull. And if you just do this, you can see where the skull itself was shattered from the impact of the bullet. This animal was dead immediately upon uh, being shot in the head. The brain looks like it might, well, I don't know. We'll just take this apart and see what we can get out of here <clears throat> and see if it's usable. There's a lot of blood in there. And if the brain is too scrambled, I might not be able to use it. But then again, I might. So we'll just go ahead and give it a try. I'm going to use my axe here. There we go. And that will open this guy up a little bit. I'm going to use the ATAX on that. I'm going to try the... Oh, you want to try the Aboconda? This is the Aboconda. It's a knife that Joe made for me. Great knife. And uh, it'll do a... A real job, massive. See the size of this, made out of 1095 steel, file work and the whole thing. But this is a powerful knife for hard work. Thank you, Ron. And thanks for the, <laughs> the nice <laughs> comments on the Aboconda. The Aboconda. Uh, yeah, it's kind of a, a play on words, you know. <laughs> this was the original name of the knife, was the Aboconda, and somehow Ron turned it around to the Anaconda. I don't know how you figured that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. That's good. <laughs> yeah. But anyway. Uh, yeah, it's working pretty good to, That's a nice knife. to get this out of here. Sure. I'm going to cut that little piece of tissue there. <clears throat> yeah, if you would. Yep. What would the Indians um, have used if they were getting into the brain? They well, just hit it with a rock? Hit it with a rock and, and smashed it. I've actually seen buffalo skulls. With a with a circle about this big chopped out of the middle of them, that are uh, from Aboriginal times. Thank you. Okay. And uh, yeah, this brain is pretty well scrambled. You can see how uh, how jelly how jelly like it is. We have uh, a piece of the skull that I just pulled right out of there. I don't know. Um, I would just like to have it less bloody. The reason why is because. One thing we want to do is we want to try to preserve this brain in some fibrous uh, matter here so we can dry it and use it for later on. And um, I don't want to have too much blood in there because the blood will turn bad on it and it'll uh, make the, the brain go rancid quicker. I might be able to wash this off in the creek. Uh, I don't know. We'll have to see. I think what I'm going to give, do is give us another whack. Okay. Ready? One, two, three. Maybe, maybe another one here too. Got down in there. It was bone all the way through this. Yeah, it was completely shattered. Oh yeah. Here, you got a bullet? No, I think it's uh, just more bone. See. Mm-hmm. But if you feel that, it's it's just all pieces of bone, <laughs> and that's just scab. But that's blood tissue that we would like to not have in there. There you go, a little juice. There we go. We got some good brain matter right here. That's what it looks like? This is what it looks like. And um, Ron's being kind enough to get it all out. What we're going to do is to mix it up with some grass fibers that we have here. Oops, laying around. And try to preserve it. Give me. I'm just going to sit this down here for right now. Is this part of the brain? Yeah. It was really scrambled bad. Oops. Let's see the edge of the... <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. That's a good, a good piece, piece right, right in there. there. Yeah. All right. Try to get that blood out there, Nisha. Yeah. Get some of that coagulated blood out. 
Good job, Ron. Oh. What we're doing is um, taking the brain out of the head here, and we're going to get a little bit of the blood out so that we have more pure brain. And this is just some grass clippings, and they're easy to use because what we want to try to do is get the brain mixed in through this grass here because the brain itself, if we try to dry the brain itself, it would form a coating over itself that would be pretty impenetrable and the brain inside wouldn't dry and then it would rot. So the mixing it with a fiber like this, and you could use any kind of fiber, um, there's some over right, I think over there, is that some? Yeah. What it does is it separates the brain into smaller pieces mixed in with the fiber and it makes it dry better and thoroughly so that we can preserve it. And so what I'm going to do is take the... Yeah. So this is this is what we call a brain patty. And it's not too bad that the brain's already scrambled. Yeah, it's actually it's actually, actually pretty, pretty good. good. Because yeah. one of the one of the pro one one of the parts of the process here is we want to squish the brains up and mix them together. And this is something that oh look we have some skull mixed in with the brain. Um, there. Yeah, there's a little bit in there. I'll be right back. Oh no, I won't. I'll wait. Yeah, you should wait. You don't want to see the brain? No, it makes me sick yeah. to my stomach to look at it. Oh, were well, you just developing <laughs> a little bit of a... Why did you get this sensitivity, buddy? Yeah. Oh, so we want to really scramble these brains up really well. Here's a piece of spinal cord. Oh, okay. It ain't going to hurt. It probably has the same type of fluid in it and, and oils in it as the brain. Spinal so we're just going to take the blood off that, and we can mix that in there with it. Now, get some of the blood out. This is um. You might wonder why you're mixing it with grass. What what good would that do? You're going to make it like a grass pancake with this, or a grass patty. And um, as it dries, it'll just. Uh, we, you know, we should have some mint or something to put in here. Is there a sprig of mint over on the wiki up over there? Would you get that, Jim? I think there is. You can, can use anything, yeah, like that to put it in. Any aromatic herb to, to make, make it smell a little Make it just smell better. a little bit better. Generally, you use about four times as much organic matter like this grass um, than you have brain. So, and the more, the better. So, the more grass we can mix in with this brain, good. the better off it's going to be. And that'll prevent the brain from making its own little coating and protecting itself, therefore making it so it doesn't thoroughly dry out and it begins to rot. And we don't want to do that, so what we're going to do is put as much grass in here as we can get mixed in. And we like to mix some aromatic herbs in there, like here's some mint. And mint is pretty good, and this will help it so it smells just a little bit better. Probably tastes better too, but we're not going to eat it. Yeah. <laughs> so we just kind of break this up and put it inside of here too, and just mix it all together. Yeah, that just... That's just cook in there. The, there's nothing really. There's nothing else in there. In there. It's, all that's all the brain we got out of it. Huh? That's all the brain. That's we got pretty out much of it. about how big that brain cavity is, right? They're, they're is the rest that, of that brain? They're not that big. You can no, that's all. It. That's all cavity. That's all that's just all bone? snot. Okay. It's bone. There's a little bit of brain, but so not this much. is going to be the brain patty, and then where are you going to keep it? Well, after it's dry, you can store it just about anywhere. Um, do you dry it on the rack like you do with the jerky, or? No, we don't do that. We just keep it out in the sun. Okay. And. Um, when you want to use it, you make it. Uh, you either put it in a pot of water, or you, or you uh, make a depression in the ground and put a piece of hide in there and fill it with water, and then just put the 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 the, <laughs> the grass pad, the brain paddy in there, and let it leach out. And what it'll look like is kind of milky. And then you, uh, once it's all leached out, then you just discard the the um, the grass or the moss or whatever it is you decided to use. And use the juice on your uh, on your hide. Mmm, that looks good, doesn't it? Yeah, man. <laughs> International House of Brain Patty. Your, yeah. your, your professional brain patty. Yeah. yeah. Maker. So. This is actually a neat way to preserve this. And it doesn't really matter as it's drying. You could actually dry it in your oven. You can dry it on a fire. Uh, you don't want to really burn it, but if it does cook, it really doesn't make any difference. It still retains the original emollients and enzymes in it that are going to make your hide soft when you want to soften it. So The only thing you have to be careful of is somebody doesn't think it's a cow pie. That's right. And, uh, it doesn't look very good to somebody, and they might just go ahead and want to make lunch out of it. 
we had some <laughs> we had some brains in our blender at one time and it looked like we had pureed them and Joe thought that was quite funny he was going to put some brains in my blender and he left it up on the counter and the kids came in and they thought it was strawberry milkshake <laughs> they said oh mom you made a strawberry milkshake <laughs> I wasn't mad at them that day so I um, told them what it actually was <laughs> So this is one brain pack. You hear that? Really you need I'll to be good. <laughs> just poke a little hole through it, um, put a string on it, and just hang it up like that to dry. And this way the air can get to all sides of it, and it dries pretty well. And then when we're ready to tan that buffalo hide, this is what we'll use. There it is. And I have a piece of you I could use. This is just a piece of elk backstrap sinew and I'm just going to poke this right through my patty over there for my brain and hang it up on the side of the shelter so it'll start drying right away. It'll dry just fine right here on the rock, but a lot of times if you hang it up a little bit, um, it'll uh, the air will get to all sides of it and it'll dry a little better. So, let me see. I might just hang it around the back side of the shelter over here. And this way, a lot of times I can just hang it like on a up here and just let it dry and uh, it'll start drying pretty well and then we could tan that buffalo hide with that it'll make a fine cape and that brain will work just fine with it One of the things I just want to mention is that you have to be cautious when you're handling brains, particularly if the brain has had an opportunity to decompose or start to rot a little bit. Um, <clears throat> they get filled with bacteria really fast and they can go from <laughs> themselves into you, particularly if you have a cut or a little scrape or even an abrasion on your hand anywhere. And they cause a very, very nasty infection really, really quick. Uh, don't ask me how I know, but when you when you have the opportunity to uh, mess with brains, it's always good to wear some kind of gloves if you can. And we didn't do it today. But, <laughs> but that's what you recommend. That's what I recommend. Since we didn't use gloves today, we decided to make a cleanup station and we used a galvanized tub with a little bit of water and a whole lot of bleach in it. The bleach will kill anything, any pathogens that are on your hands or might get into any cuts and it'll minimize any problems or most of the problems that you could have from infection. Anytime you're dealing with any kind of an animal carcass, uh, you always run a little bit of that risk, so it's just better to be safe than sorry. What I have is a uh, buffalo leg, one of, the, one of the legs from the buffalo that we butchered. And I'm gonna be skinning it out, trying to take the, the, the skin with the dew claws off at the same time in order to make a, a, an ancient style of a bag. The legs were sewn together two on, two on uh, one side and, and two on the other and they made quite an attractive bag. We're going to be trying to do that and it looks like that the skin is going to come off pretty easily on this. I'm hoping it will anyway. I have a real inexpensive little Mora knife and um, we're going to see how well that sucker works. So without further ado, I'm just going to cut down the center here and to get the cut started and we'll just take it right down this way. One of the other things we're going to be doing is to, uh, to uh, process the entire foot here. We'll be using the, uh, taking the sinews out and, and drying them and using them for various different things. Uh, leg sinew is particularly strong and we like to use that when we're wrapping um, points and things that we have, such as arrow points, spear points, things like that. <coughs> and also, um, we'll be processing the bone as well into different types of tools. This seems to be coming off pretty easy. I want to try to get this cut as straight as I can, especially down here by the hoof, where it's a little bit tough. Then I'm just going to skin this the way we did everything else. We'll just cut the membrane. Of course, it would help if I used the edge of the knife instead of the back. You can generally skin almost anything 
uh, pretty easy without cutting a whole lot just by separating the membrane tissue, the connective tissue, that um, actually attaches the skin to the, uh, the tissue that attaches to the bone. And you can see that that's all, I, all I'm really doing here is just cutting the, uh, the membrane tissue and then just pulling it back. When it stops, just cut a little more and it will continue to separate just like this. And we're gonna, looks like we might be able to get these dew claws off fairly easily. We'll see you in a minute. Then we're gonna take it around and just peel it off like a coat. thinking that some people might be wondering how you can do a really smelly job like this without puking, but this is not a smelly job. It doesn't smell bad at all. I can hold this right up to the microphone and you all can sniff if you'd like and, and see if you smell anything. Go ahead, take a sniff. See there, that wasn't so bad, was it? All right, back to the skinning. And when this is done, what we'll, what we'll end up doing is uh, We'll flesh this portion of the hide to get any excess tissue and membrane off of there. So that all we have is pure skin. <coughs> and there's a couple of different ways you can do this. You can try to, to, uh, to tan the skin, or you can just leave it as rawhide. Hey, go. Jess. Did you come over to see what's going on? See a, a little bit of a sinew right in here, right in there, inside this casing right here, and it's it's fairly short. We won't be utilizing this, but there's more sinew going up through the leg here. You can see the ends where it was cut, and we'll be taking this all of this out and drying it. And as part of our policy to use the entire animal, we'll be drying those sinews and utilizing them in our outdoor experience as well. We try to teach people that um, animals are more than just meat on the hoof and that you can use every part of it if you know what to do <clears throat> and if you take the time to do it. I think that's one of the most important factors is realizing that you can and taking the time to do it. Can I philosophize here a little bit? I guess I can. That means we live our lives tethered to uh, clocks and wristwatches, and some people even have pagers that they have to be uh, bound to. Primitive people didn't have that, uh, what I call modern inconvenience. And they were able to just, they, they didn't have money, but what they did have was time. And they were what I call time rich. And that's a philosophy that I would like to try to adopt someday if I could be time rich. It would be a good thing for all of us to try it at least once. And that's how you, uh, when you're time rich, you have the time to sit here and skin out the legs of the animal that you've killed and take the tendons off and process them into sinew and use them for thread and arrow wrappings and various different things like that. And that way you, when you do that, it brings you back into connection with the animal that you're using and you get more I, I believe that all things are connected in life and that the closer we get to understanding that the closer we get to understanding ourselves end of sermon we're down to where we're just cutting the last couple pieces of connective tissue in this and there's a little spot in here I want to try to get it so it doesn't tear off and we'll cut that little piece of skin there and then it'll be separated and we'll have skinned out the buffalo leg and see we have a fairly nice little piece of hide that we can sew we'll sew another piece here like this and then two more on the opposite side 
and trim the tops and make a really nice bag. Of course we do have to flesh the skin first. There's a, quite a bit of, of fat and membrane left on here. And I did accidentally cut it in one spot there. Shame on me. <clears throat> but nonetheless this, this is a, a fairly decent skinning job and we'll, we'll uh, like I said, put the get the rest of them and take it from there. Now we still have the rest of the leg left. We have the hoofs and uh, later on, at some point, I'm going to remove these hoofs and uh, boil them down for hoof glue. And you can see here that we have quite a bit of sinew left in here. This hard outer casing is just a, a, a membrane that connects it and we're going to try to get the sinews out just by, this is tough here. Look how tough that is. It's like cutting through plastic. When it's when it's wet, it's not a big deal. But when it's dry like this, it's tough. It's pretty tough. So there's a nice piece under here. We we'll just try to slide the knife under that and cut this way. Cut through here. See, we got a little bit of blood. There's still a little bit of blood left in there. get all this out. We'll just separate it from the rest of it and let it dry. And what happens is it, it dries very hard and yellow like this color here. And um, once that's once it's thoroughly dried it, it's um, almost like a well like a piece of plastic it feels like. And when it's uh, when it's when it's reached that state then you can put it on a stump or a piece of wood or some other soft, comparatively soft object and pound it with stones or wooden batons and that will break all that yellow casing off of it and all the fluffy sinew inside will start to emerge. And it looks almost like cotton threads when, uh, when, you're, when you're getting it out. Here's the sinew casing right here. You can see, I'm gonna take it up as far as I can, probably up to right about here. But this is getting kind of hard to cut. It's getting tough in here. I have to be really careful not to cut it in places I don't want cut, and also not to cut myself. So I'm gonna, gonna go ahead and take her right here and cut this portion off. Oops. Go. And that's what she looks like. And we'll go ahead and, and do the same with this other piece over here. I'd like to get some of this tissue off if I can. Well, it's not really necessary when you're drying sinew. It just helps a little bit. And here's the whole back Achilles tendon. I guess it's the whole Achilles tendon. There ain't no such thing as a back Achilles tendon, is there? Just like saying a, a hot water heater. Well, what the heck here? Okay. <laughs> now we're separating the rest of this thing from it. And here we go. A nice piece of Achilles uh, sinew. And we'll just go ahead and, and let this sit out in the sun and dry. And when it becomes uh, hard and yellow on the outside, you pound it and get the soft, fluffy, white sinews out of it and put them in your sinew bag. These are fairly short but they're worth the effort of getting out. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that too and just stick the knife underneath. Just cut down this direction and then grab it and uh, stick the knife underneath again and cut in, mm, I missed a spot there, there we go. And cut in this direction. There's another piece there. And then there's some more right in here. We'll try to get all of this out for use as bindings. And there we have it. We have what's left of the, well here's some more here and I'm going to get this out as well. But uh, what you have left is the, is the toes and these bones in here and the, uh, the ankle joint here and then this, this bone here which we're going to be separating 
and making into into tools. But first, I'm going to get this sinew out. Where should we put this stuff? I have the rest of the sinew here, and uh, what I'm doing here is I'm just putting it on this uh, jerky rack to let it dry. We're air drying it in the sun to, like I said, let the casing harden and also let air get to it so that it dries all the way around thoroughly. And we'll just leave it like that and pluck it off of here when it's all turned yellow and hard. How much of it do we need to cut? What we're gonna do now is get the rest of the meat off of this buffalo carcass that we, we just finished butchering. And you can see how there's still quite a bit left on there. We're gonna be cutting this off and we could actually cook this, it'd be kind of nice, but we're gonna try to make it into strips and dry it on the drying rack that you might be able to see behind me over here. <clears throat> and we're just gonna be uh, cutting and hanging. And what we're gonna be doing is getting some of this, some of this stuff off of here that we don't need and uh, then we'll be cutting in between the ribs and I can come over here and show you that but I like to get some of this off first. It's kind of glazed over and uh, it's edible but it's not palatable so we're going to try to cut some of this off first. And you can see we have a nice beautiful sunny warm day. It ought to be real conducive to drying this meat. I don't know if you can see on here where it's already glazed over a little bit right along in here as opposed to this this is open and raw when it's when the meat is glazed like this and, and like this it keeps it from getting fly blown which means that the flies are not going to land in it and uh, blow the meat that is poke a hole in it and um, lay the eggs that turn into maggots now Denise is cutting this into uh, strips that are about what quarter inch thick and we can just hang that right on the on the hide rack or on the on the jerky rack. We're we'll hanging it on the hide rack and turn it into buckskin. <laughs> and, uh, no. Hang it on the jerky rack. Hang it on the jerky rack oh. and jerk it. Right, right, yeah, right. So that's what we be doing. But I want to get a lot of this this excess material and this this is connective tissue here off. When we do it, I think I'm going to cut some of this off here so that we can see how this meat has glazed over here. Okay, this is what's going to happen as you as it jerks and as it dries. One important thing to, to know about jerky is that uh, <clears throat> if you if you can get as much of the fat out of the out of the meat as you, as as possible before it dries, because the fat can turn rancid on you and uh, make you sick. And that's not the idea behind this. No. The idea is to make something no. that you can eat and that's preserved naturally. 